Today's scripture passage is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verses 7 through 11. That's Luke, chapter 14, verses 7 through 11. Welcome to virtual service at Riverside Community Church. We are a community committed to equipping you to grow as a follower of Jesus. We're glad that you are joining us. Let us know in the comments section that you are here and say hi to your fellow worshipers. God has great plans for you and we are excited for how he will use this message in your life. Please like and share this sermon so that your family and friends can be empowered to grow in Jesus as well. Please join me in saying the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to come into your presence, to be welcomed to a position of honor as beloved children. God, we ask that you would be working in us, that you would be equipping us, that you would be transforming us to live lives that bring you honor, lives of of true humility, not false humility. And God, keep us from the sin of pride. Empower us to live like Jesus and to take his teaching to heart. In Jesus' name, amen. In 2015, the famous comedian and actor Steve Harvey accidentally crowned the wrong Miss Universe. He was supposed to be announcing Miss Columbia as the first runner-up, but instead announced her as the winner of the pageant. The look on Miss Columbia's face was one of devastation. Being named Miss Universe, receiving the crown, and having to return it was worse than had she just been named first runner-up and been able to celebrate that accomplishment. She did an amazing job holding it together, but you could see that her joy had been drained. Similarly, in 2017, Faye Dunaway and Warren Beatty, who played Bonnie and Clyde, announced La La Land was the Oscars' best picture for the year. The producers of La La Land got up and started making speeches. Then one of the producers announced that they had been wrongly awarded best picture and called the producers and cast of Moonlight to come up and accept the award. Now, the producers of La La Land were incredibly gracious and generous as they gave up their trophy. But the embarrassment of the situation was palpable. Even watching the reruns, Even the people from Moonlight and the audience needed to be convinced that it wasn't a joke or a prank being played on them.
Now, I didn't watch either of these events live, but instead watched the replays as they dominated their news cycles. So think with me of a time when you thought that you had gotten something or achieved something, only for it to turn out that you had not actually received it or been awarded. What was your experience like? Did you feel like you had lost something that had never truly been yours? Your experience along with the expertise uh, or the experience of Miss Columbia and the team responsible for La La Land are real life examples of the principle that Jesus is communicating in Luke 14, 7 through 11 our primary passage for this message. So please turn with me to Luke 14, 7 through 11. As, and as you turn to Luke 14, remember that Jesus has been invited into the home of a religious leader, a re leader of the Pharisees, and they're dining there in his home. Luke 14, 7 through 11 says, Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Throughout your life, where have you seen places of honor reserved for specific people? When I was growing up, it was usually the recliners that were reserved for specific people. At my grandparents' home, there were two matching recliners. One had an extendable leg rest that popped out and latched. That was grandpa's for his longer legs. The other recliner was grandma's. It was a real treat to get to sit in one of those chairs as a child. Similarly, at extended family gatherings, I recall the recliners by the TV being reserved for Great Uncle Cliff and Great Uncle Paul. In those settings, I remember being rushed out of the chairs, sometimes out of the room, and feeling discarded as they would change the channel to some sports game that I didn't understand or really even have any interest in learning at that time. Remember your experiences. Both the times when you were allowed to step beyond your station like me and my grandfather's chair, and the times when you were reminded that you were a peon in the eyes of your elders, like me and the chairs reserved for my uncles. 
Jesus had been invited to a dinner at the home of a religious leader. While there, he had been teaching and rebuking those around him, and it seems he wasn't quite ready to stop. Jesus is paying close attention to the social dynamics. Verse 4 or verse 7 prepares us for Jesus' next teaching. It says, Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, People are arriving and attempting to seat themselves in places that will get them seen and provide the perception that they are powerful and important people. Every culture has their places of honor. Some of the time this honor is implied through direction like being told to get up and make room for my elders. Other cultures, like those originated in the Middle East, have more complex rules that don't necessarily feel as intuitive to us as Americans. However, if you pay attention to global politics, any time that Israel, Israeli and Palestinian leaders join with the U.S. president to discuss peace, there is a challenge because both leaders wish to sit directly to the right of the president. The immediate right in that culture is considered a place of great honor and power. If the Israeli leader were to sit to the right of the president, the Palestinian leader would feel slighted in front of the world. And if the Palestinian leader were to sit on the right, the Israeli leader would assume that he and his country were being disrespected. Jesus comes from this same culture and region of the world. He is watching as people claim their positions of power and respect at this dinner gathering, potentially needing to be removed from their position because they had reached beyond the host's regard for them. So Jesus speaks a parable to them in verses 8 and 9. He says, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. Sometimes our pride and self-assessment get the better of us and the glory we seek for ourselves ends up creating mud on our own faces. It reminds me of shortly after Michael Jordan retired from the Bulls for the second time, Corey Benjamin was a rookie with the Bulls. He was a good player and he, he had had a lot of success and high school and college. However, Benjamin started telling his teammates that he could beat Jordan. Word trickled back to Jordan, and one day Jordan showed up to practice. Everyone stopped and knew why he was there. Jordan called Benjamin out and said, check ball. And they played one-on-one. -on -one. Jordan buried him. At the end of their game, Jordan told Benjamin, don't call me out of retirement again. Corey Benjamin, like many of the people in Jesus' example, 
experience the trauma of being shown that positioning themselves to a position they had not earned or been invited to backfires. So what should we do? How should we position ourselves? Jesus gives us instruction and an alternative approach to honor and our relationship to others. In verse 10, he says, But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. Here, Jesus is teaching those dining with him and us the value of humility. Unfortunately, much of what I have seen in the broader church is a misapplication of humility. One of the ways that we attempt to practice humility is to practice a false humility. False humility is when we actually think very highly of ourselves, but we act like we are nothing so that others will compliment us. We are not truly being humble, but we're seeking the praise of others. False humility is a form of manipulation. Still, false humility can look very similar to true humility. When we draw people's attention to our humility, acts of humility become pride. An example of one of the ways that I see false humility express itself is when we are with someone and we share, this is what I did for this person. And they disrespected me and I didn't ask for anything in return. When we talk and think like that, we are asking for something in return for our actions. We are asking for our pride to be fueled by the praise of others. It may not be the person that we tried to bless, the person we did something nice for, but we are still anticipating a reward and a response Another way that we attempt to practice humility is by degrading ourselves. I knew a lady who at one point in her life was one of the most dedicated workers in her church, one of the most dedicated her church had ever seen. However, any time she would receive compliments or recognition of her work, she would say, oh, I didn't do anything, it was these people. Everyone there knew she had done 90 plus percent of the work, but she refused to allow God's work through her to be recognized. You may be thinking, so how should we include others and share the respect and honor? Listen to the difference between these two statements. One, I didn't do anything. It was all so-and-so. And two, it really was a team effort. I couldn't have accomplished it without these people's help. The first insults the people who are honoring you, and it's not truthful. The second draws others into the praise and displays that God has been working through you and those around you. I have often heard it said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, 
which is thinking of yourself less. When Jesus instructs his audience to sit in a position of least authority or honor, he is not instructing them to degrade themselves. Instead, he is calling them to uplift and value others to such a degree that you assume they too are worthy of honor. He's calling us to let others bring us honor, to let God bring us honor, rather than demanding others sacrifice their honor for us. The more we view ourselves and those around us as image bearers of God, the more grateful we become to be even sitting at the table. And the less we feel the need to buy for the most lofty positions. So how do we practice humility? The times when I have been most effective in pursuing humility have not been the times when I have thought of myself as being a horrible or worthless person or so much less than everyone else. I have not done a good job of rejecting pride when I have focused on halting my prideful actions either. The times when I have pursued humility have been when I have been focused on who God is and how much he loves the image, his image bearers around me. These are times when I remind myself of God's faithfulness, his love, his holiness, his majesty, and his infinite grace. Another thing that has helped me to pursue humility is when I focus on recognizing that those around me are image bearers of God and should be recognized in that way with the honor due anyone that is an image bearer of God. We are called to follow in the example of Christ and his humility. So what did Jesus' humility look like? Philippians 2, 5 through 11 describes Jesus' humility. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus was humble. Yet Jesus never pretended to not be amazing. He never lied about who he was to get others to view him as being humble. Jesus was confident in who he was so that he didn't have to play the comparison game. As a result of being confident in his own value, Jesus was freed to humbly serve those around him. When you and I are confident in who God has made us to be, we don't need to put ourselves down or vie for positions of honor. Instead, we are freed 
to serve others. In our final verse of today's passage, verse 11, Jesus summarizes his teaching with a principle. Jesus says, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is a principle for how we interact with the world around us. Those who try to play the comparison game end up exposing their prideful natures. While those who humble themselves and serve others end up being praised and receiving honor from God. There's a deeper lesson for us to learn as well. When we stand before God on Judgment Day, If we are proud of our own ability to be good, we will be humbled, learning that the measurement we needed to achieve was the perfection of Christ. Those who trust in their own strength will not be welcomed into the perfection of God. Yet all who humble themselves by recognizing that we haven't lived up to the perfect standard of Christ and those who trust in his work on the cross for our benefit and salvation will be exalted as co-heirs with Christ. When you stand before God, will you be humbled and sent away to hell? Or will you be exalted and told, well done, good and faithful servant? It is my prayer that you would serve Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Humbly serving him and others. Confident in his love for you. So that when you leave this earth, you will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my eternal rest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you for giving us love, your love, and the opportunity to know that we are safe. In you. Equip us to seek to honor you rather than receive honor from those around us. Help us to know who you have declared us to be in Christ Jesus. So that we sit in that confidence rather than playing the comparison game. Empower us to be people who serve you and those you have placed around us with humility and joy. In Jesus' name, amen. As you go about your week, Pursue humility in Christ Jesus, not degrading yourself or exalting yourself, but instead assuming the honor and glory is due to others as well. And let God be the one who exalts you as a co-heir with Christ Jesus. Go in peace and serve him. I love prayer. It's a great way for us to connect with God and each other. So I want to invite you to Fridays at 4.30 p.m. to join us in 
worshiping God through prayer, joining one another. And it has been a wonderful opportunity to get to know each other and to see God answer prayer, to praise him and thank him for the way that he has been answering prayers. I can't wait to see you Fridays at 4.30 p.m. We'll be doing that via Zoom. One of the ways that we respond to God's love and generosity is by giving back a portion of what he has given us to support the local church ministry. Um, I want to encourage you and thank you because God has been doing great and amazing things in and through you, in and through our church here at Riverside Community to bless Hammond and Northwest Indiana. We have been seeing people growing in their faith. Many people are encountering the scripture through our weekly preaching. We are seeing people prayed for and prayers answered. And we are also seeing that um, people are being fed and cared for through our blessing boxes that we have in partnership with the Northwest Indiana Helping Hands. And so I would ask you to prayerfully consider how is God calling you to help support this ministry that we are a part of? There are three ways that we can give. We can give online through Facebook. We can send in our tithes and offerings through the mail. And we can also place our tithes and offerings and the offering plate at the back of service. So I look forward to seeing you and I look forward to seeing how God is going to work and bless Hammond and Northwest Indiana through you and through his generosity through you. Thank you again. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Please let us know in the comments section that you were here, that you joined us. Also, let us know how we can be praying for you and how we can be of service to you, helping you grow in your relationship with Christ. If you were blessed by this message, please give us a big thumbs up and subscribe or follow us so that you don't miss out on any other great content that we put out. It would really be a blessing to us as, and we want to be a blessing to you.